Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. It's episode 109, and we've got Tim Mills of Bare Knuckle Pickups. How you doing, Tim? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Great to be on, guys. Yeah, thanks Thanks for joining. Really appreciate it. And uh, what's going on, Dave? How are you doing? Oh, uh, not much. Or morning for us here. Of course. A beautiful day in Hollywood. Well, I don't know if it's beautiful today. It's kind of overcast. Oh, misty. <clears throat> so. Cool. What about you, Tim? You're it's uh you're in the UK. Yeah, it's just about dusk. It's been a pretty grey and grotty day, so you know we're all sort of pretty much embracing winter here now. <laughs> sort of moving into it. The temperatures suddenly changed. Uh, everybody's reaching for their jumpers now. Uh, <laughs> getting colder. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We had we had the sun. Yeah, yeah, the last few days of really good sun about a week ago, and I think everybody went out and made the most of it. And now I think it's yeah, long hard winter coming up. Ugh. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm almost ready for winter again. <laughs> yeah, but you're in LA. Is there really winter in LA? No, no. Oh, you want to go no, no. back? No, I see. In, in in general, in a cold climate, I'm almost ready for it again. I, I've lived here since 1988 or seven now, and frankly, it's uh, well, I mean, this is going to sound stupid, but it's it is literally sunny about 300 and uh, oh, I don't know, 40 days a year. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, we almost get no rain, almost ever. It's crazy, and. Uh, and uh yeah it's just sunny all the time and uh you know after a while believe it or not you start to go i just want to change yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just want something else i can imagine yeah but i don't like it when it rains here though this is the weird thing when i'm in a colder climate or another uh, state that is uh has seasons it's uh it's fine but here for some reason when it's gray and gloomy everything just looks ugly to me Hmm. It's just not, I don't know, weird, weird observation. Interesting. Nothing to do with pickups. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I, uh, I've heard about bare knuckle pickups for quite a while and uh, always have heard amazing things about your pickups, Tim. Um, where'd you come up with the name? I'm curious. Right. <laughs> so it's quite a quite a story behind that one. So oh, yeah? it, it comes, the idea came from my background in martial arts. So oh, yeah. as well as a guitar player, I've done a lot of martial arts over the years. And, um, you know, when I wasn't on tour, I would go back to teaching music and teaching fighting. So mm-hmm. when I got the idea of, starting up a company making pickups which was based on basic tone hunting i suppose you know i was at at that particular time i just scored a gig in a ozzy osbourne tribute band of all things so you're having to do multiple types of tones from various eras and i was really motoring through lots of different pickups from actives passives everything just tone chasing really just trying to see if I can nail various tones and I was getting really frustrated by the fact that I couldn't really get my head around what the the, the pickups were supposed to be doing from the descriptions that they were given you know a lot of the descriptions back then were very generic you know the, this pickup is good for pretty much everything it's just like well it's gonna have to be probably stronger at some things than others you know <laughs> and, you know, a, a lot of them, even their names, didn't really help you at all. A lot of some of them were just sort of weird numbers and things. It's just like, well, what the hell does that mean? Mm-hmm. So, you, so I was sat in my studio with guitars all over the floor, various states of pickup swapping going on, and um, that is where I started ripping pickups apart and then building them and putting them back together again. And <clears throat> that's where I sort of cut my teeth, if you like, making pickups. And after a while, I. I thought I, I really got my head around it and I thought I could, you know, get a little bit of a sideline here to teaching music, gigging 
and teaching fighting. So, so that's where the idea came from. And so I was sat thinking, right, what am I going to call it? You know, and I was, it just came in a flash, actually. I was, I was just thinking guitar playing is all about the hands. Fighting is all about, well, uh, the style I was teaching was, there was a lot of hand stuff in it, empty hands. And I was thinking, empty hands, what's it, what's it about empty hands? And I suddenly thought, God, of course, the old original fighters were all bare knuckle fighters. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to find a, something that was synonymous with when the UK was a big manufacturing nation. You know, we're not anymore, but historically we were. We used to make everything pretty much for the world. And I thought if I could find something that would kind of hark back to that heritage mm-hmm. to give it a kind of a foundation, um, I'll be on to something. And I thought, bare knuckle fighter. Next thing I know, I found the image of Jimmy Carroll in his boxing sash with his handlebar moustache. I thought, this is great. This all just works. It sounds cool, and it kind of captures the vibe that I'm after. And that's where Bare Knuckle came from. That's great. Yeah, great. Yeah, the, just a great marketing uh, great. name, a great uh, look with the old uh, school Bare Knuckle fighter. And yeah. Just yeah. awesome. Yeah, I mean, even with the font, you know, I was in my studio and I was like, logo, how do we tackle logo? And, you know, I started drawing things out and I thought, this is this is really difficult because I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not an illustrator. And I just happened to be staring at a couple of Marshall heads and I thought, hang on a minute, Marshall logo is not a logo at all. It's just a, a font. Script. Yeah. And I thought, and that's probably one of the most famous sort of logos going almost. Mm-hmm. So I thought I'll just I'm going to do the same work for them. So I, I came up with a, a script that I really liked, a font. I thought, yeah, that's it. It doesn't have to be anything clever. It just does what it says, and mm-hmm. that's what I wanted. And I've stuck with that font, you know, all through the years, and used the image of the boxer. Um, this guy called Jimmy Carroll, who was a world champion, bare knuckle fighter. And um, then just slowly we we introduced a, a British flag into it just to, you know, push on the fact that this is a UK made thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that's where it all came from. It's unique and it stands out. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And, yeah. it's, and the box <laughs> is full of swag. Yeah. Picks, strings. Well, you know what? Well, yeah, that's, that's yeah, awesome. I, I started that from the get go because I thought, you know, you spend a lot of money on a product and, you know, you're gassing over it, waiting for it to come. And when it comes, you know, you just want to see it. But if there's something else in there as well. You know, yeah. oh, now look at that. I've got there's a pick or a, a sticker or something. Mm-hmm. It, it, it just makes it feel a little bit more extra special. And so we put in like a beer mat, you know. I mean, it's uh, it's just purely, I mean, the first thing you do is dump it in front of your computer mm-hmm. and put your drink on it. Well, great. So next time I'm thinking about pickups, first thing you're going to see is my, my beer mat. Yeah, no, it, it, it's great. You, you see this beautiful box, and the box is uh, amazing looking. So that already is just saying, screaming, awesome, you know? Yeah. And then you open it up and you get, wow, there's the pickup, but wait, there's a, a sticker, the beer mat, the, the uh, a, a set of strings mm. and all this stuff. And you're just like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> the, the, the strings, that was something I, I was very determined to do because if you're going to change a pickup on a guitar, you've got to take the strings off. It, you can yeah. You can kind of cobble it together and sort of just about hold them up and wedge a pickup. It's, it's always best to take the strings off and do it properly. Yeah. So I thought the last thing I want is people buying these new pickups and putting old strings on their guitar. I want them to hear it as at its best. And then if it's not right, and they're coming back to me going, oh, no, this isn't the tone I want. You know, I know it's not bad strings or anything else, you know, that I know, right, okay, we've somehow got you hooked up with the wrong pickup. So, and that was the thinking behind it. You know, I want them hearing it, fresh strings. I want them hearing the best it can be. It's not sort of, oh, well, you know, 
I had to put my old strings on. They're a bit dull. You know, I don't know. I was looking for more high end out of this pickup or something. It's like, well, let's change the strings then. You know, so let's start off mm -hmm. at that point. And so that's why I did it. What strings do you send? We use Rotor Sound. Um, oh, okay. Primarily because a British company. You know, I know Jason very well at Rotor Sound. And, um, you know, I mean, we buy thousands of sets off him every month. And uh, it, it just made sense to put British made strings. They're one of the oldest known um, makes of strings uh, going. And uh, he's got, a, he's a great guy, great philosophy, builds all his own machines. You know, he's a great engineer. And uh, so we put those in. That's cool. So you were, you were in an, an Aussie tribute band? At and, that time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's what, that kind of inspired you to, to make pickups? Yeah, that, well, yeah, the, I'd been, so prior to that, I'd been doing quite a lot of session work and I was playing for um, a UK artist called Elkie Brooks, who was, uh, who is very, still very active now, but was a very big star through the late 70s and 80s. And, um, and I recorded and toured with her for ooh, certainly most of the 90s. And um, I finally decided that, you know, enough was enough and I wanted to change and that I didn't want to be on the road anymore, you know, because we used to tour a lot. And, um, you know, her tours were pretty intense. They were normally two or three month runs with as many days off, usually about two or three. It was, you know, back to back shows. Um, you know, you'd be, be nothing to do a 50, 60 day run with her and then you'd be home for a little bit then there'll be a run of private shows a lot of tvs mm -hmm. into the studio then there'll be another tour and it'll go like that you know um all year round and you spend most of your time just living out, out of a suitcase so when i decided yeah i you know um i had uh, my first child was born and after a couple of years more of being on the road and struggling to see him growing up Mm -hmm. um, I decided that I'd had enough and I very much remember when I kind of made the decision because uh, I remember he, he was at one of the shows and I was looking out from the stage and I could see this baby crawling along the lighting gantry <laughs> towards the follow spot guy who got his mag light out and lit him for me so I could see him and he pulled himself up and was holding on to the lampy's leg, fully lit. And there I was playing a solo, fully lit by the lampy. <laughs> and I thought, you know what, I'm not sure I want you know, my relationship with my son to be like this, him out there and me over here. You know, it, it was, it just got me thinking. And so I hung up my boots and I thought, right, I'll just go back to teaching music teaching martial arts and just be at home a lot more. You know, I thought I'd done my time on the road. Mm. Anyway, after a couple of years of that, one of my friends uh, sends me a message. Hey, we, we're doing this Ozzy Osbourne tribute band and it's going down great guns, playing lots of big venues. Our guitar players messing, messing us around. Uh, we've got a very big show coming up. Will you just jump in and debt for it? And I was like, right, okay, well, what are we talking about? Well, it was a two hour show. Oh, so wow. send me the set list. You know, it was like every single Aussie classic. And I knew some of them, didn't know some. And then there's all the Sabbath stuff in there as well. And first thought was, ah, it's a lot of work for one gig. But then I thought, you know what, I want to see if I can actually do this, if I can pull it off. Because mm. there's only a chance to really have a, one rehearsal with them because they were all the way up in Birmingham, uh, which is quite a way away from where I live down in the southwest. So I learned all these tracks, went up, did a rehearsal with them. The night after, went and did this show. And it was probably the most fun I'd had in years, just playing rock and roll. Mm. All the songs are great. You don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about writing them. The, the, some of the greatest rock and roll songs in the world. And the band were really good. And the guy that did the Aussie thing, he was just absolutely hilarious. It was just... I kept looking over, thinking it was like being on stage with Ozzy. He had all his mannerisms, everything. And within 
the first song, I'd been hit by a bucket of water and had fallen oh. over flat on my back. And I was lying in this puddle of water, still playing, just laughing my ass off, thinking this is absolutely amazing fun. <laughs> and I then proceeded to get hit by about four or five salvos of pyrotechnics that were going off all over the place because the, the pyro guy had said, look, I'm going to show you where all the reveals are. And I was like, look, I'm not interested. I've got 20 odd songs here in my head. I'm trying to remember. I can't be doing with trying to remember cues. And there was flame projectors going off all over the place. And come the end of the show, my pedal board was just covered in sort of fallout debris. And I, I just thought it was the best thing ever. And so I said, look, back in the dressing room afterwards, I said to the guys, you know, if this other guy's messing you around, I'll just do this. You know, this is so much fun. And uh, and that started a run for about two or three years of working with them. And uh, and it was a lot of shows. It would always be about two or three shows every weekend. So I'd be back up the road again and, and doing that. And that's where I really started digging around, looking at different tones, you know, because I, I thought I can either sort of just do this the Zach way or I can do it the Randy way or I could try the Jakey Lee way or what have you. <laughs> Lots of choices, all different. Yeah. And, you know, and then there's all the Tony Iommi tones and the Brad Gillis <laughs> stuff, you know. So, and, you know, it, it was that that just started, you know, started me going. I was pretty committed to playing Les Pauls at the time. So the first thing I did was sort of sort out that Zach tone. I was using two Marshall stacks split in stereo, just two 800s mm -hmm. with a super overdrive on the floor that Robert Keeley modded for me back mm -hmm. then. It was one of the first ones he did. And um, yeah, just a wire and a road vibe, and that was it. And it was a thunderous tone, you know, a couple of early 80s Les Paul Customs and worked a treat. But then, of course, I started chasing down other sounds. And right. that's where the tinkering started. And I started pulling pickups out and putting pickups in. And, and obviously, Zach was, used, was still is using the EMGs. Great sounding pickups, did exactly what they said they were going to do. But I started thinking, I wonder if I can get that sound a different way through a passive. So I'm not always messing around with the batteries. And I was kind of looking for a little bit more dynamic control as well. I, I felt that the sound was was very compressed, which is very flattering, but it just wasn't happening for me when I backed off the volume. And I'm quite old fashioned like that. I don't tend to use a volume pedal. I didn't tend to ride the volume pot all the time. Yay. So, so I was, I started thinking, you know, I wonder what the passive route to this would be. And then, so I started pulling out some pickups out of older Les Pauls and I was having a look at these and figuring out what, what made them tick. And I just bought so many different pickups and ripped them all to pieces, put them all back together again, tried them in different guitars. And I used the band as a, a way of sort of field testing everything. So every show I'd take out this rack, the six, six to eight guitars on and the guys are like what why are we carrying all this stuff and i'm like because i want to try out all these different pickups and so i'll be changing guitars every every song or every two songs and see what you like see what uh, yeah oh, that's a great way real world it testing it's yeah. awesome yeah and just you know and, and i found that if i was absolutely kind of lost in the moment just playing and just absolutely really enjoying it and not thinking about anything, I'd know that I was on to something. Whereas if I was fighting with the guitar, you know, mm -hmm. you still got 600 odd people and you're there to get cracky, this just isn't happening. You know, I'm digging in, there's not enough coming back under my fingers or whatever, or whatever it could have been. I would change guitars and try to the next, the next prototype. And I, that's how I learned, you know, by experimenting with all these different wines. And so every week I'd be making up bunches of pickups, changing all the guitars, making my notes in my book. And off I'd go up the road again to try a whole new bunch of prototypes, you know, and sometimes <laughs> think, right, that is definitely not working. <laughs> you know, it sounds awful. You know, it's <laughs> great in the studio, but it's when you're in the heat of battle, that's when you know when something really works or not. You know, when everything is crammed to go through a big rig, 
you know, and you're having to play the notes right. You know, the gear's not working, the notes are gonna, you know, your head's not gonna be playing playing the notes right. So it, I spent about a year, year and a half doing that. And it's towards the end of that journey that I thought, right, I've learned, I felt I'd learned enough to know how to tweak all the variables in the pickups to get the sounds I wanted. And so I thought I, I could just put maybe a simple website together, three or four models, could have a little sideline there and came up with the bare knuckle thing. Mm -hmm. Then I, I used a box that was, they call it a hand stitch box, but it was like, I wanted a box like the old car parts came in that used to have like the grease paper sort of that, that used to get down the motor factors and stuff like that. And uh, my dad was a big mechanic and he always used to take me around like auto jumbles and stuff like that as a kid. And we were all rooting through these boxes, you know, and it was a really tactile, organic type of feel. And I thought, yeah, that just feels real. And so I found this company that still made boxes the old fashioned way. So they're cut and folded and they have these staples put in. And I thought, well, then I can just get a sticker with the model name and that would go on the top. There's a sticker on the back and then two stickers on the side with all the tick boxes for the information. Then I could just need to use, I'll uh, just be using that one box and I'll just have different stickers. And I did that for quite a few years, but then the model range expanded and it was just getting to be a, you know, a shit fest dealing with all these different types of stickers. Mm -hmm. And that's why I moved over to the box that we've got now, which is, you know, one that we get flat packed and then we can make it up. But uh, and it's got all the various models, all the options. So we now we just have to deal with a humbucker box, a strap box, a telly box, a P90 box. Whereas before I had stacks of stickers for every single thing. But right. going going back to to those four models, um, I thought right there we go. Four hundred. What, what were the original ones? The, 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 the very first one was the Miracle Man humbucker because, like I said, I was chasing down that Zach tone. But at the same time, I knew I had to nail a paint applied for properly. And so I spent a lot of time running that in parallel. And I was obsessing over sort of late 59 paint applied falls. <clears throat> I was lucky to, to uh, be sent some by a very good friend that I made around that time who kind of mentored me a lot. Um, he was known back then as over the pond guy and uh he actually reached out and contacted me and because he could see what i was doing and without ever sort of saying to me look tim you want to use this magnet and this wind he would kind of drop seeds of with me you know have you ever thought of doing whatever and i'm like no i haven't and i put the phone down of course, next thing I'm going to try it. And then uh, I sort of think, what's he on about? Uh, try this wind. And um, he'd send me some different types of magnets, the ones I was using, and have a little play with these, see what you think. And I learned absolutely masses from him about the original humbucker, if you like. And so I thought, if I can get that right, absolutely 100% right. I've got the proper foundation for building whatever I want on the top mm -hmm. because they're all based on that humbuckers I'm talking about. And then I applied the same process to strats, tellies, P90s, whatever else. I did the same process. But with the paint applied for, um, but you know, when I first started, I was just using a generic punched out chassis, generic covers, you know, whatever I could find. But as soon as I earning a bit of money, I thought, you know what? I need to tool up and make my own parts because, you know, when, when you're using off the shelf parts, what tends to happen is you think, right, that's a reliable supply. And then just when you commit to it, you can't get them anymore. And it's like, oh, God's sake, you have to change and find something else, mm -hmm. you know? Fastenings and things like that, absolutely nightmare. You think, oh, these are brilliant screws and then can't get them anymore, you know? So I learned very early on to make my own stuff. Yeah. So the first, you know, 
as I earned money, the first thing I did was tooled up and I've, funny enough, I, I bumped into a, an engineer at a guitar show who was telling me he was making guitars. And I said, what do you do for a living? He said, well, I'm a press tool engineer. I was like, ah, oh, that sounds interesting because <laughs> I haven't got space for a 20 ton power press, but I bet you've got loads of them. And he's like, I have. So I showed him uh, an original bass plate that um, I'd been lent from a, a, a late 50s paint apply for. I said, can you make that? And I said, I don't mean kind of make it, I want it exact. And I pointed out all the things that I wanted, all the tooling marks, even down to the grain in the nickel silver, you know, as a, it's gonna be 100% right. The exit hole, it can't be down here, it can't be here, it's gonna be exactly here, all the measurements, the way the leg tabs come, the actual brake angle, all of this sort of stuff. And he said, yeah, I can do that. And that started a relationship. Uh, and he still basically does all of my metal work today. Um, and that started back in 2004. And uh, now I think the majority of what he makes is for Bare Knuckle. So, it, you know, he barely does any work for anybody else anymore because we, we have so many metal parts and tools that he's made and he you know i own them but he maintains them and has the power presses and stuff so once we we've done that the next thing to knock off was the humbucker cover and at the time all the aftermarket humbucker covers a lot were made out of brass which are horrible no good at all um and a lot of the nickel ones were either razor sharp on the bottom and you're always cutting yourself and they, they, they also had this horrible corner to them that just looked wrong. And if you ever look at an original paint applied for, you'll notice that the corners have this draw in them. It's almost like the old television sets that had that pull in the corner. <coughs> and nobody was doing this, even Gibson, you know, all the, the humbucker covers had these rounded edges. There's a reason for that. It's much easier to make in a tool. Getting sharper lines in a press tool is really, really difficult especially when you have to uh, a reasonably deep draw on the side. Also, I wanted the, the screw holes to have a slight, ever so slight countersink. If you ever take a paint applied for cover off and run your finger on the inside, you'll see that those screw holes are actually pushed in slightly and you can feel the edges of them. So they slightly dip in like that. Whereas most of the aftermarket ones, they're just a straight punch. Hmm. And it's all flat. So it's just all these little details. And at that time, there was a company called Dead Mint Club that were doing what was claimed to be the best, the most accurate paint and ply for cover in the world. But I thought I can go one better than that because they still hadn't got that corner draw right. And so Dave and I worked for about the best part of a year getting that tool right. We were going backs and forwards, backs and forwards until we <laughs> nailed it. And then that became our the basis for our cover. So we had the base plate right, we had the cover right. Next thing was to sort out the bobbins. And um, the, there's, there's quite a story with humbucker bobbins because um, the originals are all celluloid butyrate. So I knew I was gonna be committing to a cab type tool. Over here in the UK, plastics tooling is insanely expensive. You know, you, you you can be in excess of ten, fifteen thousand pounds for a hardened steel plastics tool that that will serve you well. You know, um, even, even a, a sort of aluminium tool, you know, can still be many thousands of pounds, but it'll only give you X amount of pressings. So um, I started doing a lot of work on um, paint and applied for uh, bobbins. Now, when Seth Lever did the, um, his paint applied for, there was the originals only had uh, slug coils. So there was two rows of slugs. So later on, they decided for whatever reason that they wanted 
an adjustable screw coil side. I suspect it was probably sales team or somebody saying, look, you know, we want a bit more to be able to say about this. You know, it just looks a bit boring without it. So they, they, they put the screws in. So a different tool maker back then made the bobbin or the tool for the screw coil. So you've got, so we've got two bobbins that externally look the same, but if you ever strip them down, they're not the same inside. And part of, no, part of the secret that they're paying the plug for, not the whole thing, not the whole secret, but part of what makes it sound the way it does is the fact that the islands that you wind around are asymmetrical. They're not the same size. Okay. So you, you could put 5,000 turns on both, but it wouldn't be the same. It would never be the same. So a lot of people, you know, harp on about the fact that they're uh, offset windings, you know, because they were using um, a, a winder without an auto shut off. So it'd be like, yep, that, that coil's full, off it would come, that coil's full, off it would come. So you'd have, you know, boxes of coils and the windings are all slightly different and they could be as different as much as sort of three, four, 500 turns difference. But at the end of the day, that screw coil is always going to be different to that slug coil because the di internal dimensions are different. It was made by a different tool maker. Hmm. Hmm. So once I sussed that out, I thought, right, I've got to do that as well. So <laughs> that's, that's what I did. So we, we spent ages with, um, Going, going through CAD drawings and stuff, getting these just right, all the ejector pinhole, uh, pinholes right, and um, even the font on the inside, you know, making making sure that it was exactly the same. And I thought, if we can get, nail this, then we can have a really good chance of recreating that original tone consistently. Um, and, uh, and that's what I did. So I have my base plate, my cover, my bobbins. Got, I started working with a, a foundry to make the magnets the way I wanted them, all in rough cast, sand cast, whatever you want to call it. I contacted Gavit Wire, who'd done the original braided wire, went for a strand count on the braid of originals. And I said, <laughs> this is what I want. <laughs> the exact strand count. And so, like, yep, fine, we think we can still do that. So it's great. So, you know, literally went, went through every single hoop I could. And I thought, you know, um, down to uh, making our own screws, our own slugs. So Dave, my metal guy, he makes all our slugs. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, all our pole keepers um, make all of those. We make everything. Um, got a local guy does all my maple spaces for me, you know, um, thrilling job making tens of thousands of maple spaces, converting lovely <laughs> pieces of maple into matchsticks as he calls it, but he, he does it. And, um, yeah. So those early years, there was, there was a lot of just constantly reinvesting and a lot of analysis going on. And, at that time, still doing the tribute band and still taking guitars up the road and just testing and testing and testing and listening and testing. And then I'd throw some out through other pro players that I'd know just to get their ears in on it as well. And that has been very much my way of doing it. Rather than looking at or obsessing about, say, inductance, resonant peak and things like that, always come back to what does it bloody sound like? It's got to be the most important thing. And yeah. then does it sound like in various different scenarios? And that always comes down to playing under fire. You know, you can set up and get a perfect rig tone in your studio or a rehearsal room, but the moment the lights go down and that intro tape runs, everything changes and the room fills, you know, and the smoke comes out. That's when you find out if that pickup sounds right and, it, and it's working. 
And so that's always been my definitive test. That's awesome. Well, well now after that whole dissertation, you just sold a bunch more pickups because <laughs> I'm sure Cause, you did. Cause I, uh, even, I, even I'm like, okay, well now I got to try more. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, my mule humbucker, as far as I'm concerned, that's as close as you'll get to a 59, the better 59 humbuckers. Um, you know. And what would be the better 59 humbuckers? Well, I, now, I've experienced a bunch. I have a bunch of clients that have original yeah. Les Pauls and 59s and different things. There's one in particular guitar that, that belongs to a client of mine that is just unbelievable yeah. sounding. And it's not one with a lot of low end, and it's not one with a lot of high end. Yeah, it, it's it just has this mid range growl to it, and in the bridge pickup, and it just sounds beautiful, just amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I've heard it, other ones that are kind of scooped and a little yeah. brighter on the top and a little looser in the bottom, which I don't like as much. I've I've, I've uh, played a few that just sound darn right flat. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing going on at all. You know, I, I've repaired a lot over the years and I've done work for clients that have got 59s and things. So, you know, and like I said, my, my friend um, who also is, is a, a luthier as well as a, a pickup maker that helped me so much in the early days, he would send me examples and, you know, say, listen to this one. And you could, the good ones were just so much more, um, they were more three-dimensional. You get this incredible note bloom. There's masses of headroom. There's depth, but there's no flub in the tone. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the bass is trimmed, is shelved off. Yeah. It still seems to extend somehow. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like there's no bottom end there. That's why it's yeah. so yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a depth in there. And then there's just this mid range that carries through a mix. Um, but That's exactly what I'm talking about with that pickup. Yeah, yep. Exactly. And the notes literally come out from under your fingers. It's almost a touch sensitive playing experience. It's, it's like the guitar is trying to play itself through your fingers. That's what eyeballs feel like. You know, where you put your fingers, the notes just bloom up. They, they're doing exactly what you want them to. You know what I'm talking fight to get mm -hmm. the things out mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's what i modeled it for. and um uh, back in back then sort of 2003 uh the, the other pickup that was closest to that i'll just say was that the there was lots of tom holmes humbuckers floating around back yeah then. Mm -hmm. tom Great really pickup. knew exactly what that was about as well mm -hmm. You know, I I learned a lot listening to his pickups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that they were very much a benchmark. I did um, some work for a guitar player over here called Jeff Whitehorn, who is the proper harem guitar player. And Jeff sent me down several sets. It's like, listen to these. Just listen to these as well as as the paths. You know, mm -hmm. there's something in this that he's he's understanding about those original paths as well. Yeah, the Tom the Toms are were amazing. I, I had some of those over the years. Yeah. I mean, he, he handmade his own screws, handmade mm -hmm. his own covers. Yeah. You know, he wasn't trying to be vintage correct in the materials. I mean, the screws they had these beautiful deep heads. Have you ever spun one out? And the lead in on the screw was just absolutely beautiful. It just purr as they would go into the coil. And, um, and it had this lovely big head on it as well with an almost flat top but it wasn't quite flat and it if, if you work with screw makers trying to get them to get that top just right can be torturous <laughs> 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 interesting yeah that's awesome i love the attention to detail i love it um we've got some super chat questions you mind if i jump over to those tim yeah you go for it Okay, cool. Uh, ben J twenty eight twenty seven. Thanks for the super chat. He says, "Tim, my favorite ever pickup is your EVH eleven. Uh, oh, it means the VH two. Yep. Uh, oh, VH two. Uh, yeah. Which boot camp model is the closest? And how do you get to live in Cornwall and play with pickups all day? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
the last question is the easy bit. That that's a life choice, and um, it's uh, but the VH two boot camp. Okay, just to give a brief overview of boot camp pickups. The idea behind boot camp was to produce a range of pickups for people that weren't interested in nerding out, if you like, on pickups. Some people uh, look at our range of pickups and almost get overwhelmed by the choice. And some people think, ah, maybe I'm not a good enough player. And that, that's absolutely rubbish. You know, everybody is good enough. It's, um, and so what I wanted to do was, um, hey, come here, come here. Um, you can come in on this. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I wanted to do was produce a range of pickups that were for people that just either weren't interested in understanding about specs and things, or, or, um, or were kind of scared to even dip their toe in the water. So the thing with boot camp is there's three output ranges and four types of pickup. So even if you've got a guitar and you think, I don't know if I've got a humbucker or what, I don't even know what humbucker is. We, we made it pictorial. So it was, you know, does it look like this, 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 or this? Is it a humbucker, a Strat, a Tele, or a P90? So you think, oh, it's that square one. Okay, you've got a humbucker. Right, next, there's three output ranges. There's the old guard, true grit, and brute force, basically low, middle, high. And these are the types of music that you would usually play with those sort of output ranges. What do you think you fall into? Which field? So it's, it's just basically giving them three landing pads, do this, this, or this. So, and that was the idea, is just to take the pain out of it. And then there's no options. So we're, we're, we're known for doing these incredible ranges of, of finishes on our pickups. But with boot camp, it's either black or zebra coils, nickel or gold covers. The, they're all short leg, they're all four conductor. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I've, I've just basically stripped it all down to make it very, very simple and quick to choose the pickup. You know, and if and then it's kind of if you like um, an introduction to bare knuckle. So you can come in at this level, and uh, you know we've got lots of pro players who use them as well. Ones that just aren't interested in different models are like, I just want a high upper pickup. I don't care what it is. All right, brute force. There you go. That'll do the job. Just a black humbucker. Just throw me a black humbucker. It's like right there you go. That that'll do it. <clears throat> so. Uh, so to answer this chap's question, what is closest to the VH2? The closest would be an old guard humbucker because the VH2 is essentially a, a patent applied for. Um, but uh, it's one that I tuned very much by ear to kind of not replicate Eddie's tone because as we all know, Eddie's tone was in these, you know, it's, but it's to put you in the right place to be able to have a go at doing that. And um, so with the VH2 features the most heavily offset coils I use in any of uh, my pickups. So they're, they're not unbucking, but they're sort of leaning that way. So what I'm what I was trying to do with it is to stop the phase cancellation being quite so complete that you get in a humbucker where you've got completely symmetrically wound coils. So as you offset the winds, essentially you're opening up the frequency um, mm -hmm. uh, range and mm -hmm. you start getting a little bit more of that depth and a little bit more high. And that's, that's what I was hearing um, in his tone. But, uh, but essentially they're what you call a moderate output pickup. So the old guard humbuckers are moderate output. So and what yeah thanks what what a uh, magnet are in the vh2s they're they're um they're rough cast alnico fives hmm. the long ones vintage cut so with, with magnets as you if you like stretch it along its width you actually reduce the pull ever so slightly 
So if you use a shorter magnet, the magnet, mag uh, magnetic field gets stronger. So you actually increase the output or the ability of that pickup to drive. And um, I didn't want that because that would tend to close up the headroom a little bit. Hmm. You know, and right. it's all about dynamics, you know. It's, right. It, yeah. it's, it's like this, you know, it's, it's listening to Eddie play. It's just hearing somebody speak through their guitar. You know, it's probably the most dynamic you can get for, for a rock uh, guitar player. Hmm. Uh, we've got a question from David Van Erde. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Hi, Tim. What pickups were in Jimmy Page's number one left paw when you had it in your shop? Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. It's been rumored that it had a Seymour Duncan in the bridge and a PAF in the neck. Thanks. It, that is 100% right. It had a symmetrically wound Alnico 5. Um, Seymour Duncan uh, in the bridge and with polywire and in the neck was an original pain applied for but not the original one to that guitar so we're talking about the number one guitar the story goes that Joe Walsh gave it to him it's the one which has got the skinny neck on the back where a lot of the wood is missing between sort of fifth and ninth fret um, it, various rumors about how that happened some people say that it's uh, it's just wear, but I've never seen anybody wear through that much timber. It's impossible. So I think somebody had a go at it with a spoke shave. Oops, sorry. I was walking over a guitar. <laughs> um, it, it, you know when people sort of try to do this kind of thing, you know, on a on the neck of a guitar, they're trying to strip it down on the back. Love that on a Les Paul. Huh? I love that on a Les Paul like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is, or whatever. Yeah, Zach. Yeah, but uh, well, uh, this one, it isn't isn't a Zach Wilde Les Paul. This was a this is a eighty two Les Paul that had one of the most awful tops on it. And um, a guy I was teaching guitar to at the time, his father sprayed um, cars, and this was back when I was doing the Aussie thing. And he said, "Oh, my dad could put a bullseye on that." And I was like, "Yeah, right." He said he couldn't. He said he will. <laughs> I was like, "Okay." So I stripped all the hardware off and gave him the guitar, and it came back, boom, <laughs> and he'd done it. And uh, Austin Healy White as well, I believe. <laughs> but it was an absolutely superb job. But uh, it's quite an unusual um, early 80s one because this horn is actually marginally smaller than on any other Les Paul custom I've got. It's quite, quite bizarre, but it's got a three-piece maple neck on it. But... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I digress. The um, Jimmy's number one, the, the neck goes almost like as thin as an Ivan is. It's really quite unusual. But a lot of what that guitar sound is about is from that neck. It's because it's resonating so much, it's free to move. And it is tight as a, it, 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 it reminded me of playing like a cello, if you bow a cello and you get that home sort of sound you know anything palm muted was so percussive it was absolutely incredible um so yeah that makes a lot of sense just over just over 8k in the bridge on the seymour duncan which had been in there for a long long time according to his the guy he sent down with with it, it was his personal assistant the guy called lionel who um turned up with this, the guitar just chucked in the footwell of, of his car. Uh, I, said, <laughs> I was like, so where is it? Expecting a big unveiling. He said, it was in there. <laughs> he beat up old case. And I was like, that? And he's like, yeah. And I sort of I opened it. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, it is. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> that that must have been special. I was like, that. that's probably worth, you know, over a million pounds if you had to insure it or something. Yeah. So, okay. Well, let, let's get it in the workshop quickly. Yeah. I made him stay with it the whole day. I said, you know, you're not to leave the room. If you go to the toilet, you take it with you, you know, because you can imagine. Yeah. So, yeah so, I don't want responsibility for this guitar. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> you know, and um, why was it there? This was before the O2 show. Okay. Oh, okay, a big reunion show, and um, it came to me 
through Manson's guitars. And the boys at Manson's were looking after John Paul Jones. I think Hugh Manson had made, or Andy Manson, Hugh, made guitars for John Paul over the years. They were teching for him. And Jimmy had been getting his gear out and sort of getting back into it and stuff. And he was convinced that there was a problem with the neck pickup. And so they said, send it to Tim. He'll check it out, you know. And um, so they sent it down and the guitar had one push pull on it. And um, so I was gonna, I mean, it, it worked absolutely fine. So what I thought I'd do is I'll take some measurements off that neck pickup and I'll make a clone of it and then I can give it back to him. So if the worst happened and it stopped working, he's got a clone pickup. So I cloned the finish, everything, and uh, let him have that back. <coughs> but so I had the guitar on the bench and uh, the neck pickup was reading just shy of 9K. So it was a really hot pickup. But for uh, you know, for a, a pain applied for to, to get forty two gauge up up to DC resistance of nine k, you've got to have a lot of wire on there. You know, it'll be really spilling out of the the bobbins. And those those late fifty nine paths, you know, when you look at the coils, the wire is literally hanging to the edge, but they're not wound very tight. So there's a lot of air in there, and that's where you get this this three-dimensional thing because the thing is kind of um, so microphonic if you like all those tiny little air gaps mm -hmm. all moving around is that that makes them just sort of spark up under your fingers and um anyway i was lionel said jimmy said you can take it apart if you want i was like right okay and i, I looked at the screws going around the pickup mounting ring and they were so rusty i was like I know what's going to happen. I'm going to put a screwdriver on that and the screw head's going to come off. And so I was like, no, I can't. I can't take that pickup out. That's going to have to stay there. So I just know something will go wrong if I try to disturb those. They've been in there for so many years. You know, you imagine if the pickup ring suddenly split or something like that, you know, and, then, <laughs> you know, like, like, and they do, you know, because they're under tension. I thought, crap, if it's been there like that for years, it could just go ping. Um, so I flipped her over, opened her up, unsoldered the neck pickup, and we left it for an hour, just let it cool right off. I took all the readings I needed to from there, used Gauss meter on the, up on the um, neck pickup, got my Gauss readings for the magnet. And I would have said that that was an Alnico 2 neck pickup from the readings I was getting, not a four or a three. <coughs> and that magnet was quite discharged. And when you played it, it almost sounded like a strap up in the net position. I was so surprised because we all know what Les Paul necks can sound like. You know, they can be quite throaty, quite fluty almost. This right. one was super woody. It was like cheapers. You know, this is awesome. It was absolutely awesome tone. You know, you wanted a, a great path tone. That was it. That was just absolutely stunning. But um, Lionel said, Jimmy said to tell you that isn't the original. So, but he can't remember when he swapped it. So that's all I can tell you. So yes, Seymour Duncan, um, spec wise, I would say probably not, not far off what they call their 59 humbucker, I think, mm -hmm. Alnico 5. Um, but this one was definitely wound with poly. It wasn't uh, wound with plain enamel. And up in the neck, uh, an original um, paint applied for DC off the top of my head. I remember it's, um, I've got it in my book, but it's about 8.9, something like that. And with a quite low reading Alnico 2, I would say in there. I didn't dare, different. I didn't That's dare different even different. The screw out to see. Yeah. I didn't want to change any facet of it, facet of it yeah. at all. Yeah. You know, so I just left it. But um, but yeah, we we had it there for the whole day, and I was given permission to play it. So I was like, damn right, I'm going to play this and play this and play this until the guy literally prizes off me. <laughs> yeah. would... so it, that those sort of opportunities come along once in a lifetime. That's and, amazing. You know, I was like, right. 
thing every single damn Led Zeppelin riff I know and just thinking you put your fingers where Jimmy put <laughs> put them to play this yeah stuff. yeah that's awesome it, it was very very cool it's um, surreal it's really it was sort of like uh, it was sort of like me restoring Eddie Van Halen's original Plexi Marshall that uh, used on every record yeah uh, just like kind of surreal <laughs> yeah completely <laughs> Yeah. When you when you started playing out of it, right? And oh, well, it right. just it, period. It's just like you're just looking at it, going, "Oh my right, god!" Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> even, even just touching something like that, yeah. right? Yeah, you yeah. Put your hand on it, and you think, yeah, you think what this has been through, what this has done, the music it's been through, the people it's been in front of, right? The history, or yeah, yeah. yeah. You could be that piece of equipment. What you would have seen, you know, it's absolutely incredible, really. Right. Yeah. So, um yeah what a so, great opportunity so that's the answer to that <laughs> that's awesome uh mike bilson thanks for the super chat uh i got asked if i wanted to fight once when i walked into a pub with a bare knuckle t-shirt on <laughs> oh, <he's okay. laughs> Gr uh, great company though thanks <laughs> <laughs> uh you got to be careful where you wear that shirt yeah uh, Bruce W., thanks for the super chat. Tim, love your pickups. I put them in all my guitars with the Rebel Yells being my favorite and my Les Pauls. The fact that you personally answer questions is awesome, too. Ah, you're like Dave. Right. Well, this is this is a – I'm sure Dave does this, too. It's um, – customer service is the most important thing when you're making stuff for people because – I have a personal philosophy that there isn't such a thing as a, a shit piece of gear, excuse my French, but it's, it's just the wrong piece of gear for the player. Mm. Yeah, you have badly made pieces of equipment, but every piece of equipment has a sound and can be used for something. What you've got to do is to connect the two. So it's getting, in my case, pickups, Dave's case, amps, pedals, whatever, is making sure that the, what the player thinks they want or what they actually want, and you're, you get the right product out of your range to them. They then go away happy. But more importantly, will it make them sound better? Yes, it will, because they'll go away and play confidently. Confidence transfers into tone. When you play a piece of music confidently, it sounds great. When you play it and you're not too sure, it sounds awful, you know, and that can be one of the biggest effects of tone, if you like. And so interacting with your customers is absolutely crucial. Really find out exactly what they want. And, uh, you know, right down to what do you play? Tell me about the guitar. I want to know the bridge. I want to know the neck construction. I want to know what it's guitar's made out of, if it's not a brand I'm familiar with. I want to know about your playing styles, you know, and I want to know really what your playing style is, not what you kind of think your playing style is. You know, a, a lot of people, are, you know, I play, I play metal and jazz. It's just like, hang on a minute, metal <laughs> and jazz. Well, you play <laughs> one or the other. What you're meaning to say is you're a technical metal player and you have to sort of get around that, you know, it's, Jazz is a totally different kettle of fish and we'd approach it in a totally different way in terms of equipment. And you have to have these conversations. You can't just say, oh yeah, you want one of those, see you later. You know, because they'll go away and put it in and go, oh no, that doesn't work. That's shit. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, no, it's not. It's because I haven't done my job. I've just fogged you off with something. So you can't do that. And especially in a, a world where communication is so instant you know, we can all sit here, different parts of the world, talking about gear. People can do it all day long, you know. And um, you, you can destroy a company in seconds if you don't look after people. You know, really same philosophy, people. exact same philosophy. And, and, you know, everyone's always surprised when they're getting me uh, answering. Uh, all the emails come to me. Mm. Um, if I need something done, I some I, you know, hand it off to someone maybe to ship something or do things like that yeah sure um but they all come to me because i've never understood not because so what's going to happen is some customer service person is going to do this job okay so if he does that job then he gets a question that of course he doesn't know yeah then he's just going to come to me and ask me that ask question anyway yeah. and then i'm going to uh, 
have to relay it to him. And then if he relays it to the customer properly, that's a whole different story. Um, so in the end, I'm just answering it anyway. So why don't I just do it and cut yeah. out, cut out all the middle. Yeah. But the nice thing is, yes, we got to have to take care of people. You know, you make stuff, stuff happens. That's I mean, so tube, tubes go bad. Um, you know, when you're manufacturing things, sometimes there's little, you know, th they're handmade. Yeah. Along with being handmade comes errors. Mm. People, if people make things, they make errors. They're yeah. not a computer. Mm. <laughs> they, yeah. they, they make errors. They make soldering errors. Things happen. You know, you try to whittle that down so it doesn't happen very much, but it sure. happens. Yeah. And, and then you, worse, you, worse you, off, you're using parts from other manufacturers. Yeah. And worse off is when all of a sudden you realize that, hey, this manufacturer's part is starting to fail. It yeah. shouldn't be, but it is. It's a defect in their production. So then, you know, oh. <laughs> and it's the domino effect. Yeah. It's the domino effect. And then and then worse off now, now we have, you know, parts delays and COVID-related delays and yeah. shipping-related delays. And, oh, God. <laughs> now, yeah. now you're like, we can't get this capacitor. What else can we use? Well, yeah. Okay. Exactly. We can exactly. use these. No, that'll be fine. We can use those. And you're always constantly jumping through hoops these days to try to keep yeah. production rolling. With talking face to face to customers, I have two guys that work for me in sales. That also liaise. Yeah, one uh, is a wiring kind of specialist. So what we t what I tend to do is every day when I wake up, first job open up my computer normally about half past five, six o'clock in the morning. And there's, we have a ticket system. So all the emails and we, we have a live chat on our website as well. So if somebody's not manning that, it converts it into an email so somebody can then follow it up. So there's this huge basket full of, of tickets, if you like. And so I go through and I sort of say, right, I'll have that batch. Ben's going to have that batch, you know, and Tim will have that batch. So mm -hmm. things that are more wiring specific, Tim will, run through timmy another tin and um ben is more based on dealing with the trade so people wanting to buy you know the product into selling their shops but he'll also deal one-to-one -one with uh, customers and i'll do all the rest and uh same on instagram and facebook oh uh, yeah so i feel your pain come in. and but i pretty much had to sort of divide myself into three because I was just literally spending my life just doing this all the blinking time, you know, and my wife would be like, you can put that down. And it's like, yeah, no. Literally, this is, this is me. Yeah. And you're like, honestly, if I don't, that is a potential sale. And you ask me yeah. to put down and not service a customer, but there comes a point where you go, you know what? That is pretty shitty you know, you have to have a life too. So I've, um, about ooh, 2010, I kind of got to the stage where I was making myself physically ill, trying to do way too many things. You know, I was making pickups. I was the only one that would answer the phone. I wouldn't let anybody else answer the phone. I was doing all the, all the emails. I was doing all the procurement. So I was ordering everything. And I was just, you know, I was spending all day like that, winder, laptop, do, 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 do a few questions, wind some more coils. Can you get that out of the pot for me? Yeah, thanks. And it's like, oh, you've run out of what? Oh, Christ. You know, and it's like, I forgot to order whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, so these days I work with um, another friend of mine who is a strategic planner and we have a monthly meeting and we work through all these bottlenecks most of it back then was me being the cork in the bottle, not it didn't go past because it was my baby. I didn't want anybody else ruining what I built up. So you got all these guys working underneath you, but you're not really letting them do any, do any, uh, anything at all, you know, other than basically making stuff. But somebody would be like, I could do that for you, Jim. No. Or you walk past somebody's station. I oh, don't worry about that. I'll do that. Yeah, I'll do that too. Uh, <laughs> I'll do that. Tea? Yeah, I'll, I'll make the tea. 
you know, and you're trying to be all things to all people. And you realize you're doing 16, 17 hours a day, you know, you're just essentially waking up to get through the day to get back into that bed, just to go to sleep for a little bit, to get up and do the same thing again. And yes, you have, to, burn you out. you have to do that in the early stages of a business to get it to move because you don't have the funds. So you've got to do that. But as funds start coming through, you've got to take that cork out of the bottle and start letting other people do these jobs. And you have to suck your ego up and go, yeah, okay, here, have a go. I know you're going to do it wrong, but until you've done it wrong, you're never going to know how to do it right. And you've got to let go and let them do it and not mm-hmm. keep going, no, don't, give it here, I'll do it. You, know? <laughs> you can't, you just end up with everything and everybody else is sat there looking at you going, who? <laughs> how are you going to do that lot <laughs> it's impossible you know, you know i mean the guys will tell you stories of in, in the early days coming in to work in the morning and i'd be asleep on my winder oh god and i've been there all night you know winding till the eight hours in the morning and eventually we just put my head down head up morning and be, you've been there all night yeah and you just can't do it no, exactly. especially with a family, and you know, yeah, when when it all kicks off, everybody rolls their sleeves up and pitches in. That's a totally different thing. But when, um, but on a day by day basis, you know, I remember one Christmas, um, I spent Christmas Day in the packing room. I had the kids in helping me pack, and we worked all day. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, that's fine once, not every year. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Can I step back and go right. This the real problem here is me not allowing other people the chance to show that they can do it too, and that does boil down to ultimately when you're honest with yourself, your ego. You kid yourself that it's because oh no, it's my business. I don't want to be messing this up. Yeah, there's an element of that too, but e- equally is well. If I let you answer the phone next time it rings. They maybe won't answer, ask for me. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. But I tell you what, after a little bit, when they don't ask for you, you think, oh, I can get on with this now. You know, and you think, why didn't I do that before? You know. Right. And, right. And so I don't I don't even have a phone in my office anymore. You know, if the guys want me, they'll come up and say, Got a call here, you need to take this one. Right, give me the phone. I'll speak to whoever. But most of the time, it's like, can I speak to Tim? Tim's up making pickups. Can I help? Yeah, sure. Boom. There you go. But if they can't, then they come knock on the door. And right. we'll sort that out. But I still make sure that I handle a chunk of all the interactions. Because I need to – you get your feel for your business that way. You can mm-hmm. feel the pulse of it. Is there anything changing in playing styles or the requests coming through? You need to feel that. You don't want to hear it secondhand. Yeah. You know? So when you get your everybody together for a, you know, um, I call them prayer meetings, you know, where everybody comes into work and you're like, let's just have a little chat here about where we're at, who's doing what, anybody got any problems with whatever. You know, somebody might say, have you noticed that everybody's playing, I don't know, like, eight string guitars or something, you know, and this starts a discussion. You think, yeah, are we tooled for that? We should we be tooling for that or whatever, you know, I mean, in that instance, for instance, uh, with eight string humbuckers, I did six and sevens for many years thinking uh, when the eight strings started popping through, you think, yeah, do I spend like 15, 20 grand tooling up to make those parts? There's not enough coming through yet. So we used to hand make them. We used to make all the bobbins. We'd get seven string bobbins, cut them in half uh, on a bandsaw, and then we'd glue them all together and literally, and then sand them all down, get out all the lines, all this sort of stuff. Just do it that way. But there, there, became a, there was a tipping point where all of a sudden it's like, look, we just can't keep up doing this. Right. Yeah. We need to tool. Get the bloody tool in. <laughs> yeah, let's do it properly. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like that age old thing of you see a guy walking across your workshop to borrow somebody's screwdriver. And you've been backwards and forwards 10 times today. 
buy him a bloody screwdriver. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's really easy to say. And it's not so easy to do because you're like, yeah, he's going on, going with that screwdriver again, but I'm too busy over here. It's like, no, you, you've got to take care of those things. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's smart. Uh, Andrew Phillips, thanks for the super chat. Uh, Long time bare knuckle pickup user and recent Cali owner. Uh, awesome. Tim, can you talk about how you hooked up with Steve Stevens and how the Rebel Yells were developed? Right. Okay. Steve. Um, so we're 2004. So I was about a year and a bit into the company. In those days, I used to process all the orders manually. So first job in the morning, the orders would sort of drop in and I used to have a PDQ machine for doing credit cards and I'd process all the orders manually. So like there's credit card numbers and you could do it back in those days. There wasn't all this data sort of stuff. And I used to put the orders through. Anyway, this one day this order came through and it said Steve Stevens. Uh, it can't be Steve Stevens. I thought, but then I thought, well, how many people are there with that name? Didn't think any more of it. Anyway, for some reason, his card wouldn't work. So I had to email him and said, that card number, it was a diner card or something, something I didn't, my machine wouldn't work with. And so he emailed back and said, sure, just try this one. Oh, that's great. So we did that. Anyway, he ordered a couple of pickup sets over the course of that year and it got to sort of mid-summer and I got an email from Steve Stevens and it just basically said hey I use your pickups quite a lot I'm doing a, a gig in your country would you like to meet up I was like huh maybe it is Steve Stevens then <laughs> you know so I replied I said sure where's the gig he said it's a place called Castle Donington well, it was the Monsters <laughs> Rock Show. And I was like, yeah, this is Steve Stevens. So I was like, yeah. He said, right, I'll sort it out. You just turn up there. I'll meet you backstage. And so I remember it was like the following week or something. So I got in my car, drove up that day. Sort of you go to this funny office place where they hand out all the passes. And I said, uh, my, um, my name's Tim Mills. You know, Steve Stevens has got a pass for me. And I said, no, nah, sorry. I was like, oh, right. So I texted him and said, there's no pass. He said, oh, sorry, two seconds. Next minute, the girl comes back and hands me a pass. In I go into the artist village, sort of wandering around, all these big rock stars everywhere. It's like, oh, that's so, that's so and so. Up bounces Steve. Hey, shakes me by the hand. I sit down and have a chat. And um, we're talking about the pickups we were using. And he said, uh, I want you to hear what my rig sounds like. I was like, how are we going to do that? He said, just come on stage. I was like, I can't just walk on the stage at Donington. You know, there's like tens of thousands of people there. He said, no, no, no. He said, you come on with us, but wait in the wing. He said, I'll get my set, my um, tech just to angle the back line in. I said, right. So... Anyway, come to showtime. So he comes out of his caravan, beckons me over, and we sort of walk up the ramp. <laughs> so with Billy was there, everybody's there walking up this ramp in ran the through the sort of draped things at the back of the stage into the wing. So I'm stood Steve, Billy, and the other guys the other side of the stage. And there was, if I remember rightly, three sets of cabs. I think he was running a wet dry rig back then or something. Mm-hmm. And there was masses of gear. Yeah. yeah. But it, there was like fridges of stuff and they'd flown all this in for this one show. They were over in Europe. But they got the whole thing angled in at me. And his tech was like, thanks, mate. <laughs> it's just gonna be really loud. <laughs> and watch the show from there. And Steve's like, I want you to hear what I'm hearing. And I was like, right, okay. So and that's how we got to know each other. And um, we decided we'd do a, a signature pickup. And he spent the rest of that tour, which I think was the Devil's Playground tour, a being stuff, doing it kind of my way, taking guitars out, sending pickups. He'd load them up. He'd go on the show, go, yeah, that's got this and that that I want. 
this one hasn't. And that's where the Rebel Yell came from. It's a great sounding pickup. That's yeah, great. it's it's a uh, it's still one of uh, my favorites. I've got it in a lot of guitars actually, and <laughs> um, you know it's, it's a medium output. I think a lot of people immediately think for some reason that Steve's going to be all about gain. There's a lot of headroom in there as well. But Steve's also a fan of what he calls his Zeppi pickups. He loves path type voicings as mm-hmm. well. So we especially we have, in recent years. Yeah, and you know. I often get an email from him saying, you know, can, can you make me a whatever? It's like, yeah, we can do that, you know. And, um, or you tell me about the guitar he's got that's got maybe some unusual system in it, you know, a ray gun built in or an Evertune bridge. <laughs> yeah, it's just not working. He's like, you know, can, can you do something with this? Or, or he'll come back to me and say, I want a real heavy, med- heavy metal pickup. It's like, yeah, we can do something like that. You know, he's, and he's been, he's the nicest guy. But you know, inside out, Dave. But yeah, he's the nicest, most genuine guy, and he's he's an incredible guitarist. And he's um, a guitar player, yeah, yeah. And he's always had the cleanest tone. And that day, being stage side, you know, I was just like, you could kind of hear a pin drop still with all this going on as well. It was that clear, you know. You stand stage stage side with some players, and the sound can't you know can quite often when you're off axis a little bit can be really quite unpleasant. But it was absolutely pristine. You know yeah. the way of describing it. It was so clean, but it wasn't sterile. You know, it was just like this is how I wish I could sound. It just sounded absolutely amazing. It That's really, awesome. was, you know, and. The, um, you know, obviously all these big pedal boards and the amp rigs and the, the racks of stuff. I know. build it all. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you did. I was, I was about to say I'd, I'd hate to be there if, if that if went wrong. But I know Steve's the sort of guy that quite happily would just grab a couple of pedals and plug straight in the front of an amp, you know, and still will. Sound amazing. Sound yeah. great, you yeah. know, and um, I remember him saying to me that he had to go and do a, uh, uh, like an in-store thing and i said how are you gonna you know do do that you can't get all this stuff in in the music store you know you fill it he said no i just tell him to give me a back then he said a cork pandora he said I'll do it with that <laughs> i was like damn <laughs> yeah I'm sure like make it. Get, get some good sounds out of that yeah you know, <laughs> you know and yeah uh, Modern Vintage, thanks for the super chat. Tim, I have the Blue Jackson Masterbuilt Misha Relic SoCal's Strat that you made custom middle and neck single coils for. How would you describe them and what production models are closest? Thank you. Okay, dealing with the last part of the question first, the Trilogy sure. Suite coils are the closest and they are a high output 44 gauge wound single coil Aramco 5. So it's kind of P90-ish in tone when you do a, a, a sort of muscular wind with a 44 gauge. 44 gauge is very fine wire, and um, but I still stick with an Aramco 5 magnet. So with Misha's, I think on this guitar, I think he's got a Ragnarok humbucker in the bridge, and that is a serious muscle machine. That's you know, it's um, hot wine and it's sat on a huge ceramic magnet. So mm. you, know, you couldn't really go putting in vintage coils. It, the output would probably strangely still work, but it's just the tonal difference is so extreme. <laughs> you know, you go from this really tight compressed tone to this really big dynamic sound. <laughs> again. It's just right. like, whoa, 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 what's going on here? That's just too much. Right. So, yeah, so I basically wound up these 44 gauge uh, beasts to put with that. Um, thinking that, I, I think at, at the time, Misha just, just had to make this one for him because he had this idea about this HSS thing and Jackson has since sort of jumped in and made lots of them. You know, we're making hundreds of these now. Oh, wow. That's great. That is. Yeah. Um, modern vintage. Uh 
Oh, thanks for the super chat again. Tim, of all your Les Pauls and Strats, do you have a number one favorite for each that you use for development, testing, pickups, or a few? What are your favorite amps? Right. I do have favorites, but when I'm doing development, I do jump around from one guitar to another. The fatal mistake is just using one host. <clears throat> You're pinning all your cards to one mast. <clears throat> you, when you're doing R&D work, you really have to try lots and lots of variables. Those pools. Um, you got a few. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, one, you know, uh, this one here would be the one that I've tested most stuff in. That's a nice Les Paul. Yeah. So this one has had pickups in and out of it. <laughs> you see, it's quite quite battered old beast. But I've used this one a lot. But you know, what year is that? This uh, it's not that old. I mean, it's hmm. it's pretty beat up, but it's um, I think it's about fifteen years old, something like that. Okay. But, um, you know, you don't want to be just used to that. You need to then go into like some of the darker uh, Les Paul customs or uh, something like. You really know a pickup's working if it come up here, if it sits well in this. This is a, a Norlin um, gold top. This this one weighs in about thirteen pounds. It's mm. probably the heaviest Les Paul you could ever play, and it's very dark, three piece mahogany neck. So I will always go to this one as well because I want to hear what's happening with you know a, a really heavy uh dense body like that but um and then i'll quite often flip into you know a super strat type thing this sort of thing so mm -hmm. this is a custom shop just generic hss uh super strat out body on that i'll also then want to hear it in ash as well so yeah there's there's quite a bit of jumping around when it comes to the guitars um but uh my personal favorite guitar is, is actually this. <laughs> Just I'll telecast. This yeah. one goes everywhere with me. <laughs> so if you're talking about actual personal favorites, it would be that. But when it comes to testing pickups, I've, my office at work's probably got about another 40 odd guitars in it. Um, there's guitars all around the unit as well. So, you know, we, we test in so many different instruments. So, Great. amp, my favorite amp, and I'm not gonna blow smoke up Dave's ass, but it is my Dirty Shirley combo. I, I've used that since I've had it for a couple of years, and I still can't find anything to better it. That, that one I absolutely- Except for the new twin sister that, yeah, that you uh, want. Yeah, well, <laughs> twin sister's on its way, so I'm really looking forward to that one. But again, uh, I mean, in the room here, I've just got that one, and there's a Dover over there, which is a nice amplifier. But um, at work, I've got amp racks with loads of 70s Marshalls. I've got um, all kinds of amps. We've got Victories. We've got, you know, so we, we don't sort of, again, just go, go, sounds great in the Dirty Shirley. You know, therefore, it's yeah, you got to try it in everything. Yeah, we, we right. run through all sorts of different amps, non master volume, master volume, even going through plugins, all sorts of things. You know, you, you run you run the goal there with it. Yeah. yeah, cool. That's great. Very well, yeah. well thought yeah. out. Yeah, Alex C has a super chat. Um, he says, Tim, is your F space bridge pickup a 53 millimeter? Yes, it is. Okay. And then Dave, the golden pearl is amazing with my run 20. This show rocks. He says, I got it on my cell phone. Cool. Well, thank you, Alex. Awesome. Appreciate it. Um, there was a question from Mike Torin. What's up, Torin? We can't answer his questions. Oh, I forget it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a guitar player, curious how you protected your hands during martial arts. Uh, his, his are mangled after 20 years. Right. You can see they're pretty mangled. You can see that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's, it's tough, tough, of course. And I mean, it's one of those things where, as you get older, then you know, 
you obviously take care of what what you're doing. But majority of my martial arts was done through my 30s and into my sort of early 40s, and I pretty much stepped away from it then. Although a couple of years ago, I did go back in and um, had a just tried a, a different martial art for about 18 months, but. Uh, you know, you start fighting the youngsters and you realize that you're not a youngster anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you're like, this is painful now. <laughs> well, it's, it's just in your head, you're still as fast as you always were, but you really are not. <laughs> when you, you, you fight someone who's 20 and you're in your 50s, you are not as fast as that. Yeah, that's a different and, story. You know, but, uh, you, you have to use different kind of tactics to, uh, to win, which quite often you get frowned upon. So, uh, yeah. That's funny. Uh, Rack Effects, thank you for the super chat. Great show. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Um, let me see. Got another one from Servando Flores. Tim, what do you recommend for a PRS McCarty 594 thin line? Similar to an SG in construction, Leaning towards lower output pickups into higher into high gain heads. Yeah, I make a pickup called the Riff Raff Humbucker, which is uh, based on the 1960 patent applied for, which were the first ones that used the, the shorter magnet. And you remember what I said earlier about when you shorten the width of a magnet as it goes across a humbucker. So I'm talking about. Um, so when I'm talking about the width, I'm talking about this way, not that width there. Mm -hmm. so the shorter magnet sits in here. Um, it's a couple of mil shorter. You just get a little, you get a little lift of output in it. And I wind that with a slightly closer coil offset. The, wheel, the coils are still asymmetrical, but the offset isn't as much as I would use in, say, a Mule or a Stormy Monday, which are based on the 50s patent applied force. So that tends to focus up the mids a little bit more. And that sounds really, really good in a thin line style guitar. And it's got plenty of headroom and it will saturate under gain really, really well. And if you go on the website, you'll see that in the sound clips for that pickup, this is the Riff Raff Humbucker. You'll see there's some classic rock tub clips, but we then do a high gain metal clip to show what it sounds like pushing a high gain rig and it's it's insane and being a moderate output pickup you get that lovely trimmed bass response so super percussive but really angry and gnarly where you want it to be sold <laughs> riff raffs you know, okay I'm, now i just need to buy a guitar that's like that <laughs> yeah I, I, I use uh for hard rock band I play and I use Riff Raff in the bridge and a mule in the neck for with a lot of my single cuts for that. You can do, well, I, I would say if you can't do it with those, you can't do it. You know, it's, mm. it's just a great, especially if you're like using, riding your volume pot, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I like to try to stay away from the pedal board as much as I can. <laughs> and if, if I can get away with it, just have a wah wah on the floor <laughs> or not even. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, uh, Tony Silkenskin, Silken, Silkenin. Uh, thanks for the super chat. Uh, thank you for the amazing show. Tone Talk is the best thing on the net. Well, wow, thanks so much for val so much valuable information. Cheers from Finland. Bare knuckle rules too. Have a have to get a silo set. Great, awesome. Um, uh, let me see. I know we have more super chats. I know we're running against time here. Dave, how are you doing on time? I'm fine. You're good? Yeah. And you, Tim? Yep. I just see the reflection in the door. Oh, no, that's a reflection on my screen. I thought, I thought it was my wife sort of bouncing around with kids, but I think she's, because <laughs> it's kind of bath time now, but she said, don't worry, we'll be fine. I said, look, you know, you know, <laughs> just come on in. <laughs> You let me know if you got to run. No problem. Yeah, we're, we're, we're good. Uh, Stomp Box Initiative. Uh, thank you for the super chat. Hi, Tim. Can you tell us the difference between yeah. Alnico magnets types 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, et cetera, and their effect on tone? Okay. So, this is a whole box of frogs. 
there are two types of aggregate flow. There's, and it's to do with the way that the magnets are formed and magnetized. You have anisotropic and you have isotropic magnets. The majority of pickups on the open market today will be anisotropic. They'll, most will use, if they're using Alnico, will use an Alnico 5 magnet. Um, aniso, uh, aniso um, magnets are magnetized in one plane, okay? So, and that makes them a lot stronger. So they have much more pull and they'll create a, a, a stronger magnetic field. So that means that they'll drive the current in the coils uh, a lot harder. Um, isotropic, the other word for isotropic magnets is um, unoriented and uh, well, uneven, I suppose some people call it, but um, they're magnetized almost not randomly, but in multiple planes. And that has the effect of making their, their pull slightly weaker. So vintage pickups, you will tend to find isotropic Alnico's in. Alnico 2, 3 and 4 are nearly are, exist purely as isotropic magnets. You can get an isotropic 5 as well. It's not that common, but I do use it in some pickups. And most recently, the Polymath Humbucker uses um, an isotropic 5. Um, and the numbering system, 2, 3, 4, 5, you can get a six, you can get an eight, and you can get a nine. You'd have thought it might indicate the strength of the magnets, and it kind of does, but the order would really go three, two, four, five, six, nine, eight, <laughs> in terms of how strong they are. Yeah. In, in guitar pickups, the most common ones are twos and fives, um, since I started out, Alnico 4 really became a thing, thanks very much to the work of Over the Pond Guy, doing a lot of um, X-ray spectrograph work on original PATH um, magnets and discovering that there were a high percentage of Alnico 4s in there, um, which a lot of people said is a type of Alnico that doesn't exist. Well, that's absolutely rubbish, it does. And it is now widely used. And a lot of uh, the other pickup makers that that uh, make PATH style pickups will use fours. Lovely, lovely sounding um, magnet. Uh, well, I say lovely sounding. The, the current subsequent reproduction of tone that, that they uh, make is good because obviously a magnet doesn't have a sound. You can't put it to your ear and hear it. It's, it's the culmination of the way it works create an AC current in the coils is the, is the sound that you're creating. Um, so uh, the ones that I don't tend to use, I don't tend to touch six, eight, and nine. I, I've experimented them so many times over the years, but I, I just don't get on with the tone of them. They tend to be very, very hot and produce just too much bottom end and too much high end as well. It's almost like an out of control ceramic i suppose mm -hmm. so in a nutshell that is kind of what the different types of alnicos do the the best way to think of them is rather than oh alnico 2 has a x type sound and so on is to think of how they work with the choice of um, magnet wire and the type of pickup that is a better way to think of the, the pickups uh, or the sorry better way to think of the actual tones that they produce is it's it's a bit of a trap sort of saying alnico 2 is a soft sound well it can be but it can also be quite bright it can also sound very compressed as well it depends what wind you're partnering it with um so it, it's you've got to look at it as a, as a whole package okay <laughs> yes yeah. so, uh, i think that's the easiest way to um, instantly, if you go onto our forum, I did write a, the Bare Knuckle forum. I think there's a sticky post at the top uh, where I talk all about all the different magnet types and their uses and, and you know, how I use them as building blocks when I'm putting together a voicing of, uh, of a picker. Oh, that's great. Um, oh, whoa. Modern Vintage, 
Can you describe the difference and best applications for the juggernauts, Rangaroks, and polymaths? Longtime custom awesome. customer of Dave and Tim. Thanks. Thanks for the super chat, by the way. Okay. So these are three signature pickups. Dealing with Juggernaut and Ragnarok first, they're the signature pickup for Misha Mansour. And the polymath is for Misha's very good friend and mine, Adam Nolly Get Goods signature pickup that we've just released. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do it starting at the top of the tree. Ragnarok is the hottest, it's a very high gain, uh, almost comp uh, compressed sound. It's got this sort of squishiness to it, I suppose, which is what uh, Misha was after when we designed it. He wanted something that would give that sort of squish that you get with an EMG, but still breathe a little bit, especially if he was to just back off the volume pot a little bit. But it had to be really, really gnarly sounding. So he wanted it for basically be a sledgehammer. And that's, that's what we did with the Ragnarok. The Juggernaut was the very first signature pickup I did with Misha. And he wanted something that had this trim, firm bass response, but also had weight in the high notes. So if, if you just go the usual ceramic route and just make a ceramic type humbug, you can get really great rhythm tone, super, super tight tracking. But when you go up the dusty end, and start shredding, it can get quite bright and piercing. And he didn't want that. His, his lead tones, or a lot of these progressive guys' lead tones, is is very fat, actually. It's it's verging on a fusion-type tone. They prefer it to be darker rather than sort of us 80s guys, which go for more of a shred tone, bright cut, you know, and it really sort of sears. And um, so the juggernaut had to be able to do those things. He kind of wanted it all, really. It's got to have this crushing high gain tone, but it's got to have a really, really good clean tone. So again, you, that that can be a bit of a seesaw, you know, to, to get one absolutely perfect, there is going to be a compromise on the other. So to get a crushing high gain tone, quite often the clean sound will start sounding a bit thin. Um, and vice versa, if you get a really fat, muscular, punchy single note tone, it'll quite often sound quite tubby for under high gain. In palm muting, you, you just get this great big blooming going on in the bass. So I approached the juggernaut <coughs> by using a huge Alnico core, um, almost like um, a filtertron, and then I put two um, ceramic flankers on the side. They're big enough to help control <clears throat> the bottom end, but not so powerful that they'll start remagnetizing the Alnico core. The problem with ceramics is because they're powerful and they're very efficient, they will start remagnetizing other forms of Alnico if they're put too close together so you could almost destroy an alnico core so i had this really really big alnico core and then two very small ceramic flankers and the combination of that gave us this mid forward projection really firm base but still some muscle for single note work and keeping the key cleans quite um uh, musical so that's what we did with the with the uh, juggernaut with Adam's Polymath, which we've just launched, Adam <coughs> wanted a more moderate output. Um, and we, in the end, we went for, a, it came out as a medium output pickup. But um, this is the one where we used the unoriented Alco 5s. And by doing that, by using a slightly weaker Alco 5, it stopped the bass being pushed, bass response being pushed quite so hard, kept the mids forward and gave this sort of, sort of chewiness to a high gain tone that he was looking for, this squish, as he calls it, when he really digs in. So it's almost like a, a type of compression, I suppose. But the highs are really dynamic. And there's, there's a slight hint of darkness to it. 
Adam is a big fan of players like Andy Timmons. And if you're familiar with Andy's lead tone, it's not what you'd call super bright. It's this really fat, but very punching sound. You actually feel all the notes hit you uh, individually. And that's where we were going with the polymath. So um, it had to be able to do a very, very good modern metal tone. But Adam also wanted it to be able to do a really good hard rock tone, which tends to be a little hairier. You know, it's not so sort of razor tight um, as, the, as the modern metal tones. Um, <clears throat> and he was also really got into doing um, serious parallel wiring. And not all humbuckers sound good when they run parallel, but we really worked hard to make sure that these did. So yeah, there was a lot of work went into that. And it wasn't easy either because we couldn't actually meet normally when I do this type of thing. Um, I get the wish list from the artist of what it is they, they want. I design the pickup, but then we all get together in a studio and I make them pretty much do a blindfold test, put maybe five or six prototypes down and don't tell them what they are. So I'll either make them all the same visually or I might make them different colors, just a, it's a sort of kind of psychological game really, to force them to make their decision with what they hear and what they feel, not right. what, not what they think. Blindfold. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, yeah. completely blindfold. Rather, you know, you know that thing of that people sort of listen to things through their eyes. Absolutely. You know what I mean. We've talked about this many times. That's yeah. with amps too. It's yeah. I always put things on an amp switcher and don't tell anyone what it what it is, and I can switch in real time, and they have to just you know exactly. don't even look. No, I won't exactly. even tell you. Yeah, and um, Adam has helped me do several uh, R&D projects with various artists over the years. Adam's got ears like a bat, and uh, he will quite often be writing notes down as to what he thinks the wire gauge is and what he thinks the magnet is. So we have a bit of a, a game, and at the end of it, he'll come out, I think that was a this, this, and this. And I'll be like, nope. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah, damn it, you, you, you've got it. But... Um, but we weren't able to play that game this time. So it was all done literally through sound clips going backs and forwards and phone discussions and so on and so forth. When you're in the room with somebody, I can read the, the response from the person as well. You know, I can see and how they're engaging with their guitar and how comfortable they are. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do that this time. You know, yeah, it's difficult. Through all these sound clips, and they'll just be on my phone. And you know, I'm like, yeah, has he really worked at that? Is is, is he finding this easy? It just, I mean, he's such a great player anyway. You know, and um, so uh, yeah, it was a little bit more protracted, but no, nonetheless, for fun. And uh, you know, it the the biggest thing really with those sort of projects is establishing the output range to start with. If you get that right. The rest normally falls into place. Mm. So it, it's and with Adam, he wasn't sure whether he wanted to go at the hotter end of vintage or in a medium output setting. And I really had to drill through that first. What is it? You know. So I was having to prototype in two directions, which I didn't. You know, I wouldn't normally do. I would normally sort of go right. This is the pickup. I'm going to hide it in amongst five or six sets, and you're now going to find it with your ears, basically. And, um, you know, rather than if, if I just sort of said, hey, yeah, Dave, there's your signature pickup, and then put it on the table, you go, oh, right, great. Is that it? Yep. Thanks. See you later. <laughs> you wouldn't feel like you'd engaged enough yeah. with it. You'd be like, well, you know, should, should, yeah. shouldn't we be talking more about it or, or doing whatever, you know? And so, I came up with this way of doing it. And um, once we found the, the pickup, which is normally the one I've designed, we then bring in loads of other guitars and said, right, now let's get out of mahogany, let's get into Alda, let's go to a different scale length, let's, you know, and yeah. then I'll pack, pack them off on tour with a whole load of guitars and they have to do the play test as well. And it's only then that we sign it off. So, right. Um, right. So, yeah. So, all of those pickups, Juggernaut, Ragnarok, Polymath, 
They're all uh, aimed at rock players. Um, you can use them out of context as well. You know, I'm not a progressive player, but I've got um, a guitar with a juggernaut in, which I absolutely love, you know, and I can get the kind of hard rock, sort of 80s type tones that I like from it. It has obviously a very much a modern edge, which I kind of like, you know, because it's, it's kind of what I like um, for, in a hard rock tone, but with a slightly different edge to it, which makes it sound, sit differently in a mix. But, um, but yeah, so that's, that's what they are. Awesome. Uh, Chris Puckett, I love high output, high gain bridge pickups. Is it possible to go higher output than where we're at today? I hope not. Um, is there still room for developing higher output bridge pickups? I mean, do you really need hotter than like 20 K? Well, yeah, but I mean, DC resistance, it really doesn't mean a lot in terms of output, because if, if, if we were talking about all pickups were made with the same wire gauge, well then yeah, DC is a good comparator because as the resistance was going up, the, you know, the number of turns of wire going up, but the moment you start changing wire gauges, DC largely becomes irrelevant. Mm -hmm. and I, I very much try to stay away from things like millivolt output, resonant peak, all of these things, because very few people understand them properly. And there are so many other factors on guitar that come into play, scale length, string gauge, how hard does the guy pick? You know, what is the rest of the chain like, you know? Magnet strength even. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, there's, there's so yeah. many, so many different variables. So yeah, I always try to drag it back to, actually, can we just talk about the sound and let's listen. Um, so when it comes to actual output, yeah, I mean, there are guys out there sort of putting out pickups with insanely high DCR readings and they're using huge magnets and so on and so forth. But ultimately the signal will compress so much that the opposite is going to happen. It's going to squash down and squash down and squash down and it's not going to get louder. It's not going to drive the amp any harder. If anything, you're going to force the front of the amp to collapse, you know, it will just start farting and sounding horrible. So yeah, I don't really think, you know, there is a need for anything like that. And as a general rule, I always, sorry, wolf hands going off again. Um, it, I always try to get players to go with the lowest output that they're comfortable with. Because the lower the output, the more dynamics you'll get, the more dynamic headroom you get, the more vocal-like the tone becomes. And I think that is when players sound their best, when they're playing dynamically. It's the same when we talk in conversation. If we all talked in a monotone, imagine what it'd be like. We wouldn't understand each other. You know, if there's no inflections in, in our voices at all, mm -hmm. we, the conversation would be so boring. And, <laughs> you know, and, and we would struggle to, to, to get the gist of what we're actually saying to each other. Music is just the same. Mm -hmm. So... Where is a very high output pickup? A high output pickup gives you that compression, which kind of fudges over your picking a little bit and makes it a little bit more flattering. And conversely, a low output pickup tends to expose a lot. And some people aren't quite comfortable with that. There is a middle ground where you can have a bit of both, a bit of flattery, a little bit of exposure, nice dynamic tone, and hey presto, your guitar player sounds much more vocal and, and dynamic right cool thanks for the super chat chris uh piplo Dukas, Dukas, uh thank you what are your thoughts about matching sets versus mixing odd pickups i have an a bomb bridge super massive middle and mother's milk in a nightfly ace it's lit it really is down to applications when I started this, I decided that rather than just make bridge pickups and neck pickups, I would always work out a set of everything so that it would make it kind of easy to, to choose. You know, so if, if you buy a, a mule set, the bridge and the neck pickup, they're not the same pickup, 
but they're calibrated to work together and balance properly in the guitar. So you don't have a bridge pickup up here and the neck pickup down here, trying to get the volume, the outputs to, to balance. And sometimes in my sets, the, the pickups will be wound with different wire, they'll have different magnets or what have you, just to present the complete package. But that doesn't mean that you can't drill deeper and say, well, actually, I like a neck tone that comes from that pickup, and the mm -hmm. bridge pickup tone comes from this. Fine. If that's your applications and you understand what you're doing on, on that basis, then go for it. You know, this guitar here is a Holy Diver bridge. I've got 63 veneer board middle and neck, you know. So that's a relatively hot bridge pickup. And these are two sort of early 60s. Um, right. Well, I just love that sort of combination, you know, but I could easily put, say, two trilogy suites, which are very, very kind of hot P90-ish voice coils that would work equally well with that humbucker. I could have gone with, say, the way I use the middle pickup, I could have gone with an Apache, which is an Alnico 3 um, in the middle, and then my 63 on the neck, you know. So, yeah, by all means, mix and match. But if, if you're not comfortable doing that, and you just kind of want the easier route, then there's a calibrated set there that will be, I know, works in the guitar. Right. Cool. Uh, Nicholas Kilmeyer, thank you. Uh, so awesome to have Tim on the show. Huge inspiration as a hobbyist pickup winder. Tim, would you mind talking about how the, how the scatter at different layers of the winding affect a pick, pickup, if at all? Yeah. Well, <laughs> they do. I only scatter wind, okay, because I, I made my own winder out of basically a small pen lathe. Um, that's how I started and came up with these little flywheels that I clamped my bobbins between. And, and I've stuck with that because it's what I know, um, you know. And uh, so when, you, when you're doing that, the wire's passing through your fingers. It's nigh on impossible to do a machine wind you know because you're human you're not going to do an auto sh transverse you know like a shuttle backwards and forwards exactly perfect like a computer would or a you know auto transverse <coughs> winding machine so you essentially are almost scattering whether you like it or not now you can scatter a lot or you can scatter a little bit if you go bonkers scattering you end up with a really quite messy coil and you can the wire can overlay and you'll start getting humps hot spots in it and stuff like that so you know I, I just sort of developed my own scatter winding technique i tend to build it up in layers so i'll put a heavy scatter layer in and then i'll wind more uniformly for maybe a thousand turns and then i'll scatter it again what i'm trying to do is just put little air gaps in essentially in in the windings so rather than all just packing in here um you get these tiny little air gaps. Some people talk about this sort of skin effect of um, current sort of running across a tightly packed coil and stuff like that. But for me, it's about those air gaps more than anything else. Because if there's thousands, maybe millions of little air gaps, they're adding to the insulator effect of that the wire, it, the wire's already got insulation around it. But if it's packed tight like that, or it's slightly off like that, there's less contact. But these tiny little air gaps are what gives a, a pickup its clarity, its 3D sort of nature, if you like. And it's that that gives it that touch sensitivity. And that's what all bare knuckle pickups sound like. And it's because we just wind them like this. Um, some people will say, well, you know, it, it, doing it like that, is it better than an auto shut off machine or what have you? I'll be honest, with you, I don't know. I've never used an auto shut off machine. So I, I don't use those machines. I only ever scatter wide. And I know the sound I create from that. Does that mean that it's better than somebody else's? Well, that's for you to decide when you listen to it. You know, I don't go up and sort of say, oh, my pickup's the best. It sounds better than that one. Well, that's back to this thing of, is, is that pickup shit or is this one good? No, they both produce sounds. It's up to you to decide if you think, I like the sound of that one, great. There you right. go. And you will find that uniform sound 
is, is very consistent through bare knuckles. People often talk about this, this extra air we have in the tone, this, this 3D thing. And as far as I'm concerned, it comes from that scatter. All right. Awesome. Uh, we're going to take a few more questions and then wrap up. Uh, Drew A says, excited to try the Abraxas set soon. Intrigued by its muscular output, yet based on vintage voice humbuckers. What was the thought build process for this set? I designed these very much with PRS guitar players in mind. Um, back when I did it, the old HFS and vintage bass sort of pairing was the main one of the big offerings of PRS but you know now they do loads and loads and loads of different pickups but back then that was very much kind of their staple and great a great set of pickups but um a lot of people would sort of say to me that they're finding that the HFS was you know too bright too metal sounding or what have you and you know looking at PRS guitars I, I, I was just thinking that I can hear a different type of voice coming from that. I can see what Paul's done by designing these pickups to, to cover all these different bases and the way it works on the, the five-way rotary. So what I wanted to do um, was to take a kind of a path of voicing, but work it to the double cut design of the PRS rather than the single cut design of a Les Paul. Mm. And to do that, I just brought the bridge pickup up into the medium output range. So it's the difference of winding the 42 gauge, literally just going to a 43 gauge wind, keeping the coils offset. So we keep that slightly wider frequency response thing going on and using Alnico four magnets, which have this really balanced response the way that they drive the coils. And that, that was what I was aiming to do. Awesome. Um, True way again. My favorite humbuckers tend to use plain enamel wire. How would you describe the basic sonic differences between plain enamel, form var, and poly? Yeah, this this is an interesting one. A lot of it, again, my my understanding of it is it's down to the cross sectional diameter. So if, if we look at plain enamel, a forty two gauge plain enamel, a forty two gauge heavy form var, and a forty two gauge poly you'll find that the outside di diameter will be largest on the heavy form valve because the insulation is thicker. Next will be the plain enamel, which is an oleinous resin insulator that the wire is run through. So sort of typically sort of chocolatey brown color. Sometimes it comes out black, sometimes a kind of inky color. And then with poly, we, we have this clear poly, um, polyester coating on, on the outside. Um, that produces the smallest cross section of diameter. So all things being equal, if we were to say put 5,000 turns on a bobbin of each, the internal diameter is the same of all of those three wires, but you'd find that the coil would be larger on the heavy form var and the smallest on the poly with the PE sat in the middle. To our ears, the heavy form var one would sound really clear, really transient, if you like. And the other end of the scale, the um, poly one would sound, to my ears, I, I call it grainy. It's, 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 it's not distorting, but it sounds hairier, if you like, because it's essentially producing a tighter coil and it just seems to uh, drive the current a little bit um, better. And then, sat in the middle is plain enamel, which is kind of the best of both, I suppose. But um, you don't normally find form var being used on humbucker coils. It, it is, and we do a couple of models with it, but historically it's gonna be um, plain enamel. And then as you move into the 60s, you see the poly coming through. And the nice thing with poly is you can just solder straight to it. It's solderable poly nylon, um, SPN people call it. With plain enamel wire, you literally have to sand the end of it before you can solder a fly lead onto it, which is a bit of a fiddle. But with poly, you can just wrap it on, solder, and it's, it makes a good joint. So that that is my understanding. It's the cross-sectional diameter that is different between the three. You hear people refer to them as single build and so on, and it's referring to the insulator 
if you like, because the wire itself has to have an insulator. Otherwise, if it didn't, if it was just pure copper as it was wrapped around the bobbin, it would just it was short, short to it. itself. Yeah. Yeah. So it just wouldn't work. Yeah. So, uh, Helios 3000, thanks for the super chat. This is, I think, the last one we've got. Uh, hi, Tim. How would you compare the mule versus the black dog? And which is closest to pages number one you had in the shop? Dave, I have a Wildwood 20 head. Love it. Considering buying a JJ Jr., how are they similar? Okay. Uh, well, those amps are probably pretty similar. A wildwood being darker in general, but some of the sounds you can get on the wildwood are definitely some of the stuff on a JJ Jr. Um, a, a little different. Wildwood might be a little thicker and a little darker. Okay. Right. Pages number one. The closest would be the mule, um, but really, if you want to nail that page number one sound you want a riffraff in the bridge and a mule in the neck so i used my go-to les paul and i was a being all day between that and jimmy's number one and that had riffraff and the mule in it and out of all my les pauls that was the one that was closest to it but like i said before there is something quite unusual going on with the neck of jimmy's number one which is a major contributor to the, the sound of that guitar because the way a neck resonates really does affect what comes off the bridge. And the pickups listen to the strings. They don't listen to the wood. It's the way that that the harmonics come off these strings is the important bit. And the, so the stiffer or the looser a neck gets, the more it will affect the tone. So in Jimmy's case, because the neck was quite, quite thin, it was able to resonate a lot more as it resonates, it means bass frequencies don't transfer into the body so easily and come off the bridge into the pick. So um, the black dog, again, I didn't name it to sort of say, oh, this is going to be the, the Jimmy Page sound. It's to put you in a ballpark vibe. That was always the idea behind the names of the pickups is to, you know, um, is, is to sort of put you in a ballpark area. It's a great Les Paul throaty, punchy mid mid-range focus humbucker um but with with jimmy's hand on heart riffraff bridge mule neck job done fantastic awesome i i gotta tell you tim you sold me uh i i um i can't wait to i can't Mark's in trouble to, now yeah i can't wait Mark to does have him. a sg thing back there that could probably use a pickup right yeah well, <laughs> that, that sg thing good. you you've got to Right, it's a junior. I probably need a P9. I need a P9. Oh, right. yeah. Nantucket okay. 90, absolute beaut. Oh, beautiful. Well, we'll be talking, Tim. I'm sure I'm going to be placing an order. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and Dave, I'm sure you will too. So. Oh, no, I, well, I well, I already got some from Tim recently, so oh, okay. I, I could, That's cool. uh, I'm kind of loaded up at the moment, but uh, there might be some other ones that I want. <laughs> I, I, I'll be in touch for sure. Um, <laughs> make sure you guys check out. Uh, the website for uh, bare knuckle pickups. I think it's uh, bare knuckle pickups dot co dot uk. Is that the, uh, the address? Yeah. Yep. And um, so def definitely check them out. Tim, thank you so much for your time and everybody thank for you. watching. Our next show is, I believe, October 30th with Brian Ray, uh, the guitar player from Paul McCartney. Uh, so we're looking forward to having Brian on and, um, we got more exciting guests in the works. Everybody check out Sweetwater, please. Uh, we have a link below and, uh, you know, we get a little kickback on the show if, uh, if you purchase from Sweetwater and also make sure you hit subscribe and the bell for the icon, uh, you know, the little bell icon for notifications on where we go live and stuff like that. So Tim, hang on while we say goodbye. Everybody have a great weekend. Dave, thank you also. Thank you. Talk to you guys soon.